Good morning, church. Great to see you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 28 this morning as we were last week. Thank you, praise team, and uh, great to see you, Betsy. Thanks for visiting with us from Texas. I understand she's going to be flying back every week to sing with us. (laughs) Oh, oh, I was mistaken. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, good to have you with us. Great to see everybody. Happy summer, even though, boy, we've been getting a lot of rain this year, huh? But, uh, oh well, no drought. (laughs) So we need rain uh, as well as sunshine, but boy, I'll tell you, singing like that and praising the Lord, uh, there is sunshine in my soul today, as the old uh, hymn goes, okay? Matthew chapter 28, we are going to read that together. I want to... Uh, build upon what I started last week as we reevaluated our role in the Great Commission. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with the Great Commission given in Matthew chapter 28. It says in verse 18, uh, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, we learned uh, some facts about the Great Commission last week, and I want to reiterate a few of those in review. The first very, very important fact that I want you to keep in mind is that this Great Commission is not just a call for missionaries to to go into the world and for believers who uh, do not go into the world but are in, in in churches like ours to give money to support them, although that's part of it, okay? But most of the time we hear the Great Commission uh, preached in a missions conference or in regard to missionary service. I want you to understand, please, that this is a commission that is given to every local church. It's not just about missionaries. It's about us getting the job done for Jesus uh, and, and reaching our world, our own circle of influence, if you will, for Christ. We said that the Great Commission is rooted in a claim. Jesus said, all, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. And we, we, we saw that that authority has been given to him by the Father in Philippians chapter 2 when Jesus emptied himself of his divine privileges and divine prerogatives and came as a man and humbled himself as a servant, and humbled himself to death, even a criminal's death, the death on the cross, that God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name that we just sang about, right? At the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will one day bow. They will, okay? And we also saw that in Revelation chapter 5, because He is the lamb who was slain, the lamb who was literally slaughtered for the sins of of mankind. We find that all of heaven worships him saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. So Jesus has all authority because it was given to him by the Father and because he is worthy. And so it's rooted in, in a claim, Jesus is worthy. And remember, worthy comes from the Old English word worthship, which is where we get our word worship. So when we are involved in sharing Christ with others, when we are involved in the Great Commission, we are worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saying, Lord, you are worthy of my efforts and, and, and my life and my, my uh, uh, evangelism, if you will. You are worthy of my time. You are worthy of, of me trying to tell others about you. And it's an act of worship. We also said that it, it, the Great Commission is given as a command. Go. Please, 
I said last week, I will always say this, it is not the great option. It's the great commission. It's not the great consideration. It's the great commission. Okay? So, if we love Jesus, if we recognize who Jesus is, we are going to be involved in the great commission because it's a command. Go. And then we said, the Great Commission has this as its core. Make disciples. Make disciples. We, for a long time, have talked about the Great Commission simply in terms of evangelism. Get out there, share the gospel, try to win people to Christ, and like I said, especially in the context of worldwide missions. But the fact of the matter is it goes beyond simply evangelizing and sharing your faith and even winning people to Christ. A disciple is a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, go out, preach the good news of salvation, and make disciples from among all the nations. By the way, we live in a nation, do we not? Oh, thank you. I'm glad one, one of you is with me. <laughs> um, yeah, make disciples. And so the commission is for us to not just send out missionaries, but to go out and and reach people, those around us, with the intent that we want them to become devoted followers of Christ. Let me say this. If you're not a devoted follower, remember I said last week, there's a world of difference between a believer and a disciple. We've got a whole bunch of believers. Yes, I believe. Yes, I, everybody believes. And some believe a little more sincerely than others. But we really are missing the boat when it comes to devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And here's why. Because it's not just a matter of knowing the Scriptures. It's not just a matter of knowing Jesus as your Savior. It's becoming more like Jesus. It's taking His Word and his commands and his teachings. Remember, he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things that I've commanded you. Now, if all you do is read the Gospels, let alone the rest of the New Testament and the rest of the Scriptures, which, by the way, is also his word, okay, you're going to find some areas as you read the words of Jesus that if you're open will penetrate right through to the heart. And he'll speak right to you about things that he knows you need to hear and you need to apply and you need to let him work on in your life to conform you more to the image of him. It's, it's not just knowledge, it's transformation. It's application and transformation. And so we evangelize, but when somebody comes to faith in Christ, we baptize. Now, you don't do that individually. The church does that. That's a church ordinance, okay? And then I use the word we catechize. Baptize, evangelize, baptize, catechize. It just means teach teach, but not just for the sake of knowledge. Somebody long time ago put that into very, very uh, understandable terms. The Great Commission means we win them, we wet them, and we wean them. But I submit to you that there's not a whole lot of all of that going on today. There's more of the evangelism that's taking place, but far less baptism and far less even still of the teaching, the catechizing, if you will, catechism. And we need to correct that. 
Discipling somebody means helping another believer learn how to be a devoted follower in belief and practice. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. So my question is this. If the role of the church is making disciples and the church is us, right? I'm gonna, you heard me say it last week. You heard me say it a hundred times. I'm going to say it again. It's not this big universal something mugwump of a... The word church means assembly. And people make up the local assembly. People who are born-again believers in Jesus Christ... We make up the assembly. So if the the role of the church is to make disciples, and if the church is us, then what is my role in disciple making? I think it's a legitimate question, isn't it? Because here's the deal. Even if we don't, if we if we do away with the whole universal church thing and we say, yeah, we, we believe in the local church. We're strong local church people. Okay? We can still say, so it's up to the church. Right? You get what I'm saying? Oh, it's the church's job. Well, you're part of the church, I hope. If you're not, let's talk. (laughs) Love to talk to you about salvation, about baptism, and about getting involved. So what is my role, what is your role in this great commission, this disciple-making venture for Jesus Christ. Well, I've got three points for you today. The first one is pray. Pray. I wonder how much of our prayer lives revolve around making disciples. Oh, we pray for our missionaries. Our life groups, we have every week, we've got mission, uh, one of our missionaries that we support that we pray for. But are we praying about the Great Commission locally, individually? What should I pray for? Pray for fruitfulness. John 15, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Now, it doesn't mean you lose your salvation if you're a believer, all right? But it does mean that he's going to prune that vine so it remains fruitful because when you have a dead branch uh, or a branch that is not producing, it's just sucking life and it's not doing anything with it, right? Those of you who know how to grow plants, uh, our house plants is, is a place for them to die. I mean, we're just, we've tried, we've tried, we've tried. My wife could just bring a, a, a sick animal back to life. And, I mean, the front yard is, if you, if you envision Snow White, right, <laughs> birds flying around, she's, she's all about it. But we have tried over the years, and I just could care less, to be honest with you. I just could not care less. I, I, <laughs> yard work, no thank you. Tie me to an anthill first. Um, <laughs> You know, that's just the way it is. That's just the way I'm built, right? But God is the vine dresser. And Jesus here says that any branch in me, so, that, so it's somebody in him, right, who's not bearing fruit, God prunes. God takes away. He doesn't, it's not about losing your salvation, but God will do whatever he needs to do to keep the vine fruitful, And he wants you to be fruitful, and he wants me to be fruitful. He goes on to say this. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he cleans, that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine You're the branches. 
whoever abides in me, <clears throat> who ab whoever abides in me, and I in them bears much fruit. I'm sorry, I've lost my place. <laughs> if anyone doesn't abide in me, he's cast out and withered. And they, are gab and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you can ask what you desire, and it will be done to you, or for you. And by this, the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be known as my disciples. Fruit bearing. That's what it's all about, bearing fruit. Jesus said, if you abide in him, that's, that's not just paying him some attention here and there. That's, just, that's not just an occasional prayer. That is camping in Jesus. That is building your home in Jesus. Your emotions, your, your, your thought processes, your time, your talents, and, and, all, and, and taking in what he teaches, putting it into your life, and by his help and his power and his grace, living it out. That's part of the fruitfulness. And the other part is reaching out with the good news of Christ. Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 13 about the uh, parable of the sower. Remember, the one who sowed seed, and I mentioned that last week. Remember, in those fields of old, they had to throw out the seed by hand. Didn't have all the automation we have today. And so in the, in the field, they had these pathways that they walked on. And that soil was tamped down because they walked on it all the time, right? It was hard. So they had to make sure that they were getting seed into the good soil, the soil that could produce, and they had to throw it out by the hands full, all the way down across, through, through that field, back and forth, back and forth, by the handful. And Jesus said, when they do that, the seed that lands on the good ground will produce sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes 100. So we've got to be throwing a whole bunch of seed out, don't we? And then Jesus, explaining the parable, says that the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Pray for fruitfulness. Now I want you to understand something. Contrary to so much of what is considered popular Christianity today, this thing of bearing fruit means dying to self. When Jesus said, see, somebody would want to take this out of context. When he said, if you abide in me, you can ask what you will, whatever you desire, and it will be done for you. People want to run with that one. Oh, that means if I'm a, if I'm a good Christian, if I do this, do this, and do that, then, then I can just ask for money and houses and, 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 and all of this stuff. And, and Jesus promised. That's not what he was saying. That would contradict other things that he said. Right? What he's saying is, if he has gotten a hold of your heart and your mind, and you are allowing him to conform you to his image and, and allowing him to conform your thinking to his thinking, right? Your heart is going to be different, and the things you desire are going to be different. They're going to be heavenward. They're going to be godly things. They're going to be things that glorify God, and what glorifies God is bringing forth much fruit. So if you say, Lord, I would love to have a, a, more of an offering or, or more of an income so I can give more to, uh, to missions, I'm just throwing that out as an example. So I, can, right, so I can be more fruitful. Lord, this would help me be more fruitful. But of course, God knows. He knows. 
But that's what Jesus was talking about. We need to die to self and count the cost. Jesus said in John 12, I, I don't, you don't really hear this from the, um, the popular preachers today, right? Here's what he said. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. That's interesting. Think about that. I've got a whole bag of wheat, wheat grains. But Jesus said, unless they fall into the ground and die, they're alone. Just sitting there in a bag. But then he goes on to say, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You see, today, popular Christianity is all about you. God exists to make you happy. If you boil it all down, that's what they're saying. And you can manipulate the forces, and you can, uh, and God has uh, some of the craziest stuff. And the fact of the matter is, God does not exist to make you happy. We exist to glorify him. And, and I had somebody say to me years ago, years ago, somebody who decided uh, they were going to leave their spouse. And they said to me, God wants me to be happy, right? Let me tell you something. God wants you to be holy, and when you're holy, you'll be happy. It doesn't necessarily mean life is going to be all yum-yums and rosebuds. But there's an abiding joy, a deeper joy, that this world and all the stuff in it can never satisfy. Never. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. He said in Luke chapter 14, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate, by comparison now, doesn't hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether there's enough to finish it? Or lest, after you've laid the foundation and you're not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock Count the cost. It's easy to say, okay, that sounds good. I'm in. Jesus said count the cost because it's not an easy road. He's not calling us to a life of ease. You see, that's waiting for us. He's calling us to a life of self-sacrifice and self-control and self-discipline and, and a life that is poured out for others just like his was for the good of everybody around us and for the glory of God, right? Biblical Christianity, the glory of God and the good of others, I really don't factor in. Now, I will tell you this. God does bless and take care of us in very unique ways. He knows how. He'll do it. But you know, all these people, I'm just going to get off a little bit here, and I know I've got to get moving, but let me just real, real quick, uh, tangent, if you will. All of these people who are telling you the best is yet to come. Believe God, the best is yet to come. This is your, you can have your best life now, right? You know what they're doing? They're making people believe that heaven's second best. That God wants to lavish everything upon you now and it's all going to be woo. And then people are like, well, heaven can wait, right? Well, that's not Bible. That isn't Bible. 
The word of God says, if we, if we, but Paul said what? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But not I, it's Christ who lives me in me. So this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So my whole life should be wrapped up in Jesus. Doesn't mean you can't have a hobby. Doesn't mean you you ignore your your spouse and your kids. It doesn't mean you can't go on vacation and, and, and have a good time here and there. It doesn't mean that. But it means my whole life, my whole uh, perspective is focused on Christ and, and, and that self-emptying that he did in Philippians chapter 2. And I want to do the same thing. But I need his help because I'm so selfish. Right? We are so self-focused. And so, pray. Pray for fruitfulness and pray for more laborers, right? Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send more laborers into his harvest field. By the way, if you're not willing to say like Isaiah, here am I, send me, I'm not sure you really, I mean, he may answer your prayer, but he might, he might want to say, I'm, I'm expecting you to be one of my laborers too, okay? So yeah, I'll, I'll answer your prayer and send more, but come on. It's kind of like, you know, the three stooges, right? All right, anybody, uh, anybody volunteering for this very dangerous mission, step forward and, and, and Mo and uh, Larry go like this and Curly's left standing. Thanks, soldier. <laughs> right? Pray for more laborers. Yes, Lord, send more laborers. <laughs> Pray and then prepare. Prepare. Prepare for God to move because he's true to his promises. Psalm 126 says, Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Those who continually go out weeping and bearing precious seed. What's the seed? The word of God. Will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. I, I, want, I want more. I want more sheaves. I want to be more fruitful. Prepare for God to move. And f- prepare for people to respond because some people are open. Some people are receptive. Especially now. Our world is in chaos. I heard a preacher recently, some of you may be familiar with Tony Evans, he talked about a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 where it says that the nations were were in turmoil because God was adding one thing on top of another to create turmoil in the nations. Why? So that they could look to him. And we're in a time right now when, when anybody would just stop and think and realize those of us who are God's uh, uh, children, God's people, must understand there is nothing we can do about it. Nothing. Except pray. Except impact our little part of the world. And ask God to move. Prepare for God to move. Prepare for people to respond. Uh, I'm saving time. I had a passage in here from Acts chapter 17 where the apostle Paul went to Thessalonica. And for three Sabbaths, he he, uh, uh, preached in the synagogue. And a whole lot of people believed. But there were a whole lot who didn't. And they stirred up trouble. So much trouble that... The, they attacked one of the uh, followers, one of the disciples' homes. His name was Jason. 
thinking that Paul and Silas were in his house, but he, they attacked the house. They were so angry. And they dragged Jason and, and some others who were there in front of the city rulers. And here's what they said. These people who have turned the world upside down have come to us too. And they're teaching things that are contrary to Caesar, saying that people should worship another king, Jesus. I'll tell you what, it, there's a whole couple of sermons there. We're seeing the same thing happen today. So you know what they did? That, that church in Thessalonica, that first church that got started there, those, they sent Paul away, Paul and Silas, and they went to Berea. And in Berea, they did the same thing. That was Paul's M.O., go to the synagogue first and preach Christ. But it, it says there in Berea, they were more fair-minded than, the, than the, the Jews in uh, Thessalonica because they were, they were open-hearted and open-minded, and they searched the Scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. And many of them believed, as well as what, they, what the Bible calls the devout Greeks. Those, those are the Greek-speaking people, the Gentiles, who had already converted to Judaism to worship the true God. But now they hear the gospel of Christ, and they get saved. And a whole bunch of people. But see, here's the deal. Satan attacks. Satan will attack. So prepare for it. Get ready for it. Listen, if Paul had to go through it, why not us, right? And here's the deal. Satan is the defeated enemy. He can only do what God allows. And whatever God allows into your life that Satan is going to try for evil, God will turn into good. He promised that. All things work together for good to those who love God. Pray, prepare, participate. Participate. You know the old saying, it takes two to tango, right? It kind of gets back to my Three Stooges illustration a little bit. It, it's not enough to say, yeah, let's, let's go, Pastor. Go ahead and, and, and let's implement some things for uh, discipling. And, and, and let's do this and let's do that. And let me know how it goes. I'm looking forward to seeing the results every Sunday morning when I show up for one hour. Right? It takes two to tango. And, and Jesus is not calling us to sit in the stands and cheer. He's calling us to get into the game. How do I participate? Well, first of all, by growing personally getting involved in discipleship so you can grow yourself. Those that gladly receive the word in Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon, were what? They were baptized. That's important, folks. Jesus said it in the Great Commission. Go, tell, baptize, and teach. Getting baptized by a local New Testament church that has the authority of Christ and the Word of God by immersion, because baptism, all, the word itself means to immerse. The Greek word baptizo means to dunk, to plunge, to immerse, because it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and baptism cannot be accomplished by somebody for somebody. Because it has to be done everywhere you find it in the Bible. It, it is accomplished by somebody uh, or, or to somebody who makes a conscious decision to receive Christ as their personal Savior. So they're the ones who say, I trust Christ for my save, uh, to be my Savior. And then they get baptized. It's a public proclamation of that 
that private decision. And I could go on and on, but baptism is very important. So those who gladly received Peter's message were baptized, and that day 3,000 souls, approximately 3,000 souls, were added to that church. And what did they do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Man, they, they got to it. They wanted to learn more. They wanted to grow in their faith. They wanted to become disciples, not just believers, but disciples of Jesus Christ. So how do I participate? I participate by growing personally, and then I participate by teaching younger believers. Now, I know this may come as a news flash. You don't have to go to Bible college in order to teach the words of Jesus. You don't have to be ordained in order to teach somebody what the Word of God has to say. Jesus never said that. And he's putting the, the onus and the obligation and the responsibility upon each of us to learn and then teach. I've used this before. Uh, I'm not sure if I have it, it recently, but if you have ever used a sponge at the kitchen sink, right, and you didn't wring it out, but you just left it there, has anybody ever left a sponge unattended? Doesn't take very long before it stinks, right? And then you don't use it for anything. You just throw it out. But if you use the sponge and you wring it out, and you, you make sure it's clean, you wring it out, you just keep using it and using it and using it until it falls apart. You can. The same is true of us. If all we do is sit and take in and take in and take in, what good are we? Unless we are growing and giving. You see? That's the process that the Lord has in mind. All of nature shows that. And so participating means growing personally and then teaching. trying to find my verse here. Paul wrote to Titus and said, As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy to res of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They mustn't slander others. They mustn't be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, and to work in their homes to do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not shame the word of God. And in the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say against us. Do you see what Paul laid out for Titus? Titus, you're the pastor there in Crete. You teach. You teach the older men. You teach the older women. And what do they do? They teach. You teach the younger men and the younger women, and then they teach. And that's the way we go, and that's the way we grow. That's the Great Commission, making disciples. So I want to tell you very quickly as I get ready to wind up here, wind down I should say, 
what to look forward to, and what to hear, what you're going to hear regularly in our announcements. Not a lot different, although you will be hearing it more and more. I'm going to put, uh, uh, I'm going to schedule the last Sunday of every month is going to be a baptism Sunday. And I want you to be praying about people who need to be baptized. They've professed faith in Christ, but they've never been biblically baptized by immersion. Pray about that. And here's something we have. We have a little booklet. Baptism. Who needs it? And, and it's an excellent little book, a, a, a workbook for people who can do this on their own, look up Scripture, and it tells you what baptism is, what it isn't, what it's for, what, it, what it's not for, etc. Good little, good little booklet. Let me know. Let Shelly know. We'll give you one. We'll give you five. We'll just order more, okay? And then, Discovering Heritage Park. I'm going to do that two times a year. I'm going to schedule it, announce it. If you have never gone through it, sign up. You will learn about us. You will learn about what we believe, how we operate, and you will learn not just for yourself, but so you can carry it out and teach others. All right? And then... We have our life groups. Now, please, I just want to say this. If you do not attend a life group, you really ought to. You really ought to. I'm going to say you really ought to. Why not? Why not? Fellowship with other believers, even if it's on Zoom. Why not dig deeper into the sermons? Because that's what they do. I, I create questions after church on Sundays, send, it to our, send the questions to our life group leaders for our groups to discuss and talk and dive deeper into, plus they get to pray together. You should belong to a life group. And then we have a ladies group on Zoom. And Lynn makes announcements about those, usually through the the, the, the um, emails and stuff. And, but the, that's a great thing to get involved in too. And then, I'm not sure when, but here's what I'm going to do. I've just got uh, some booklets in here called Foundations. And this is kind of like Theology 101. All right? Teaches about God about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the Bible, okay? I'm going to schedule, and you'll hear about it when I do. We're going we're gonna to do foundations, and I'm going to teach it, and I can guarantee you this is not going to be boring. It's not going to be just, okay, buh, 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 right? I'm not going to put a, a slide up on the, uh, the screen and then tell you, read the slide, or, or me read the slide to you, and you've got it in print in front of you too. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Because I will teach the Word of God and the truth of God with passion and with application, and it will be an informal time where we can talk and ask questions. Okay, so that's coming. But it's not going to work if nobody signs up. That's that participation that's needed. So the Great Commission is this, go preach, baptize, grow in your faith, and teach what Jesus taught. Evangelize, baptize, catechize, Win them, wet them, wean them. Not just one or two of us, it's all of us. All of us. And it's rooted in the worthiness and authority of Jesus. Therefore, you and I must worship. We must share. We must teach and direct people to the right path. Be an influencer. I didn't know that existed until a little while ago, right? An influencer. Be an influencer. That's what God wants us to do. 
Our role in disciple making is pretty clear. Pray, prepare, and most importantly, participate. So much of modern Christianity is self-focused. And yet, the more we dive into the scriptures and the more we look at the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, we find that everything about Christianity is others focused. God calls us to give our lives for the good of others. And there is no greater good than sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. And if they put their faith in Christ, helping them to grow in the faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Do you know him? Have you received Christ as your Savior? Every week I ask this question. Every week I lead in a word of prayer for those who perhaps have never received Christ. I'd like to do that with you right now, a very simple prayer of faith that you can utter in your heart or verbally. And I'm going to ask you to do it right now. Just simply say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me for my sins. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross for me. Come into my life now and save me from my sin and give me everlasting life like you promised. In your name I pray. Hope you prayed that today. If you'd never prayed it before, we want to rejoice with you. Let us know. Just drop us a line. But now I need to ask... For those of you who have trusted Christ, are you growing? Are you doing like the scriptures say? Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Are you growing spiritually, actively participating in, in an effort and in activities that help you to grow in the faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and in your spiritual walk with God? And then I ask, are you involved in helping others grow? And I say this to you kindly, lovingly. But if the answer is no, then you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. So I'm going to encourage you to begin today. Get involved in a local church. Become a member of a local Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. And in your involvement, as you grow and as you get part of that, become part of that family, offer yourself to the service of turning believers into disciples. That's what the Great Commission is all about. God bless. I look forward to seeing you next time on Heritage Park Live.